upon. My recommendations I have for you guys today is having someone with a conscience to be in charge with reviewing cases like such. It should be mandatory for any state government official to obtain any arrest history of police district in some form of compensation for falsely accused victims. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Dr. Avon Hart Johnson, president and co-founder of DC Project Connect. I come to you this morning as a trauma support specialist, advocate, author, and researcher, conducting studies in the United States and abroad. Today, I focus on four key areas and recommendations. First, black women are largely incarcerated for crimes associated with survival and coping. In essence, criminalized mental health conditions, domestic violence, unaddressed substance use has likely led to their incarceration. Recommendation number one, abolish prisons. When sanctions of last resort are warranted, these women should be offered holistic care as a community-based alternative to restore health and well-being. Second, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 5, states in part, no one should be subjected to cruel, inhumane, or degrading treatment or punishment. Yet alarming reports of physical and psychological violations occur in women's prisons every day. In 2015 alone, there were 25,000 incidents and allegations of sexual abuse, extortion, rape, groping, or other sexual related abuses in prison. Recommendation number two, we demand reparative justice holding carceral systems responsible for past harms, current harms, and preventing future harms. All prisons and halfway houses should be converted to healing centers with emphasis placed on mental and physical health care funded by the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Third. The United Nations recognizes the right to the highest attainable standards of physical and mental health, in particular Article 25. The denial of adequate mental health intervention and gender-specific health care needs in adequate menstrual products in prison result in women making dehumanizing trade-offs between basic needs and hygiene. The use of medically unsafe trauma-producing restraints and shackles on pregnant women should cease today. Recommendation number three, we demand that incarcerated women have access to adequate health care as a matter of human rights and a public imperative. Finally, and fourth, maternal incarceration has the greatest impact on children and intergenerational incarceration. According to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 12, incarcerated persons have the right to family life, a protective factor that can mitigate the cycle of incarceration. The fourth recommendation, incarcerated women should not, own, should not be arbitrarily separated from their families and their right to family life must be respected and restored <laughs> with efforts made to ensure that contact is maintained between mothers and children and vital family bonds preserved. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Excuse me, could you repeat your name for us again, please? My name is Dr. Avon Hart Johnson. Good morning. Uh, my name is Maya Hilton Garza, and as a movement attorney who has worked with prisoners who had relatives who have been incarcerated, who's lived in cities infamous for the misdeeds of their police forces like Baltimore, Maryland, Oakland, California, and Los Angeles, California, and who has lost relatives to gun violence, I am here to speak about the current state of the American criminal justice system from the perspective of someone who works inside it. To put it plainly, it's a mess. But calling it a mess is an understatement. What it truly is is a horror show. The United States incarcerates more people than any other country, being responsible for about a quarter of the world's imprisoned people. And despite accounting for only 13% of the US population, black people comprise 38% of that incarcerated population. Along with incarcerating more people than any other country, the US also incarcerates more women than any other country. Racial bias permeates every facet of the system, reflecting the direct lineage of the present day system to the earliest days of slavery. At the onset, we had slave codes, a separate and more severe set of crimes and punishment for slaves. 
following emancipation, the existence of this dual system did not disappear. While we may no longer explicitly have a separate set of crimes and punishments for black people, evidence of racially disparate treatment can be seen throughout the system. While the United States has not yet consistently and accurately collect data on arrest, prosecution, and incarceration trends, what we do know is that there is clear evidence of racially disparate arrests, racially disparate sentencing, with more and severe, longer sentences given to black people, and racially disparate administration of parole and probation. Aging People in Prison Human Rights Campaign is an abolitionist organization that firmly believes that the project of emancipation for all black people in the United States will not conclude until a criminal justice system is abolished. The Supreme Court in McCleskey v. Kemp very explicitly acknowledged the possibility of racial prejudice influencing a jury's decision in any criminal case. When faced with actual statistical evidence of racial bias influencing a death penalty case, it found that it was not unacceptable, allowing the death penalty to stand. With the Supreme Court so comfortable allowing an acceptable amount of racial discrimination to infect every black person's interaction with the criminal justice system, there is no reform that could occur that would be able to repair the corrupt white supremacist heart of the current system. Aging people in prison seeks the dismantling of, of, of the systems that support and reify such oppression, including the police, the judiciary, and the carceral state. Excuse me, could you take it a little bit slower? Sure. You, have, yeah. you have time. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to have one sentence left. <laughs> um, nothing less will set us free. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. I'm Tassley McKay, a social scientist and reparative policy scholar at Duke University. I'm grateful for the chance to share with you new figures from my research on the economic impact of mass incarceration on black women and communities. For almost a century in the US, the huge black-white wealth gap that is a legacy of slavery was slowly narrowing. Those gains, small and slow, were very hard won. But in the 1970s, following great civil rights progress in the US, our criminal legal system began to be mobilized against black Americans in an intensively violent and far-reaching way. And as it did, the wealth gap also began to widen again in a way it had not since the ferocious anti-black mass political violence of the late 1800s. During the mass incarceration years, the wealth of the typical black household has dropped 75%, while that of the typical white household has risen 14%. Mass incarceration has brought tremendous harm to black women, families, and communities, and social scientific evidence makes it possible to rigorously calculate its economic impact. I've written two academic books about this work, carefully reviewed by top economists and criminal legal system scholars, and so I have great confidence in what I'm about to tell you about these costs. The criminalization of black children and youth and their pipelining out of educational and supportive institutions has sapped $4.31 trillion. The perpetual punishment of formerly incarcerated black adults, particularly their long-term exclusion from the formal workforce, has sapped $1.07 trillion. The burdens and harms shunted onto partners and mothers of incarcerated black adults total $434 billion. The lifelong repercussions for black children of the incarcerated, particularly in lost educational opportunity, total $452 billion. 
and the community and population scale damages, particularly impacts on black infant mortality and adult life expectancy, total $890 billion. The total harm in under 50 years of mass incarceration comes to $7.16 trillion. That's more than half the value of the entire black-white wealth gap. No other form of domestic state violence carried out in the United States since the beginning of the 20th century compares to the scope and scale of these effects. If we are ever going to move beyond mass captivity, beyond the mass exploitation of black women's bodies and labor on this continent, we need universal understanding in the US and around the world of the vast harms of mass incarceration. We need reconstruction of the abusive public institutions that did these harms. And we need at least $7.16 trillion in reparations to black women and communities for mass incarceration. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, good morning. My name is Tamako Shine. I'm a culture anthropologist and the founding director of Aging People in Prison Human Rights Campaign. Uh, we decided to petition for this hearing today because we have an organization. We work to get people out who've been in 30, 40, 50, 64 years in prison. Our organization is made up of mostly women who are working to get their folks out of prison. Right now in the United States, you have two and three generations of men and women, mothers and fathers from the same family incarcerated. All of them are attached to generations of women. For us today, this is not simply a hearing, this is a trial. This is something 400 years we've been waiting. What you see here today, we are the daughters from the plantation, daughters of Maroons, daughters of abolitionists, daughters of freedom fighters, daughters of Garveyites, daughters of revolutionaries, and we are versus the United States, and they have been found guilty. The crime is the war on the African woman's womb. Anything that has come out of the African woman's womb within the last 400 years has been attacked, assaulted, decimated, incarcerated, imprisoned, and this is no longer will be tolerated. This is unacceptable. Walter Rodney, in his book, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, talks about this underdevelopment. Thus, 400 years later, the African person that comes out of the African woman's womb is still being underdeveloped by institutional racism and white supremacy racism. So therefore, today, we sentence the US and all the Western world that has benefited from our human resources to 100 years of reparations that is to be paid in full, reparative justice. In the next 10 to 20 years, we want this abolition of prisons to commence. We want the extraction of our human resources from the human resources of the African woman's womb to stop feeding the pop line of institutional racism and generational incarceration. This will not longer be tolerated. We close the chapter today on the Department of Justice, the prison industrial complex, any system of tide that oppresses our bodies, our people, the African woman's womb. Edward Baptiste in his book, The Other Half That Has Never Been Told, The Making of American Capitalism, he emphasizes this and the extremist amount of money that has been made from human resources of African people. Dr. McKay says a price so we say the fine to be paid is $7.16 trillion to the black woman only for the last four decades of incarceration, and we're talking about one institution. Today's verdict that has been passed is sealed. It cannot be undone. The seven testimonies interventions that have occurred is like the walls of Jericho, and they will fall tomorrow being the seventh day. This vertical is sealed today by our ancestors, Alberta Williams King, Winnie Mandela, Maria Elena Mayano, Safia Bakari, Louise Little, Lama Trisalatud, and Fannie Lou Hamer. They will fall today. I thank you. I turn the floor back over to our commissioners. Thank you. 
and, uh, and thank you so much. <coughs> thank you so much. Um, any additions you wish to make? You have um, six minutes. I would like either um, I would like Mama Fia and I would like Dr. McKay to make additional comments. Thank you. I, I would simply add to the information and the comments that have already been made that when we talk about reparatory justice or we talk about reparations, we're talking about full and complete reparations. And the full and complete reparations goes far beyond the money. It uh, necessarily includes the rebuilding of the individual and of a people or peoples that um, like the abused adopted child, we long to know who and what we are, where we were kidnapped from, uh, what would have been our names, what would have been our language, what would have been our spiritual development system, what would have been our social and familiar structure. There is no price that can be put on that. At the same time, every effort must be made to do so. Thank you. Thank you for the time. I'd like to read a quote from John Ehrlichman, who was the domestic policy advisor to Richard Nixon, widely understood by people in my field as the forefather of mass incarceration. And I'm quoting him now. The Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. You understand what I'm saying? We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. I'd like to add that I think it's important that we understand this as the domestic state violence that it is and has been and that the impacts of that state violence on black women in particular have been concealed of necessity because the work that black women have taken on in the face of this state violence has been to absorb, to cushion, and to defend their families and communities against it perpetually and by definition concealing the true magnitude of its effects. The costs of this system are so much greater than we have ever acknowledged, and those costs have been borne by the most vulnerable among us. And because those costs could not come out of bank accounts, they have come out of bodies. Chris Wildeman's research on the impacts of mass incarceration on population health in the United States show that, yes, mass incarceration has done definitive damage to our health as an entire population. And yes, those effects on life expectancy and infant mortality have been concentrated predominantly in black communities. And yes, those effects on life, the years taken off of American lives by mass incarceration have come off of black women's lives. When we look at the effects of rising black male incarceration rates beginning around 1978 on population health in the US, we see that the years of life lost came primarily from black women. There is so much that has happened, so much that has been concealed, and so much strength um, that has been standing in resistance to this domestic state violence for many decades. Thank you so much for the time to speak to you about it. Thank you so very much for your very powerful statement. Um, I, I should have mentioned 
something earlier that this was supposed to contain um, um, testimony about Canada as well, um, but it was decided that you would focus on the United States only. And um, we do have someone here from Canada um, because we didn't have time to inform them of the, the change. Um, but at, we are very grateful for your powerful um, statement today. Your submissions are, were absolutely, absolutely powerful and hit the nails, nails on the head. And, and really sort of um, highlights the absolute untruths which uh, have been imposed on the entire not only population of America, but the world. And it has been something that my rapporteurship has tried to work on. And I'm happy to see my two expert assistants here at the table there, Laura and Ugo. Yes. Who's just, Ugo has just joined, Olga. Who's just, just joined us. Yeah, I think today is her first day. So this is a powerful day for her to start. And, and they would be in touch with you. And I do want to ask you if you could submit to us your, your statements in, in, in writing for, the, for, for the, our use, because it enhances our records and so on. I now um, invite my colleagues, and first the second vice president, Commissioner Clark, to start with her intervention. Thank you very much, President McCauley, and good morning, everyone. Um, it's, um, I want to say it's a pleasure to have you here, and indeed it is a pleasure for us to have you here, but the story you tell is horrific and um, outraging. Uh, I just want to, because you spoke at the beginning at, about the international human rights law around uh, issues related to incarceration and, of course, racism and discrimination. But just also to, I'm sure you know it, but just for the purposes of the record here, to also say within the inter-American system, we also have a document called Principles and Best Practices on the Protection of Persons Deprived of Liberty in the Americas. <laughs> and if you have not um, seen it, I do um, invite you to have a look at it. it. It reiterates the principles that you've spoken a lot about, but I also want to just make note that one, one of the, the, the principle number one is the principle around humane treatment, and you've spoken so much about the absence of humane treatment and the, in the circumstance of incarceration, but the inhumane treatment well predates incarceration. It's across the justice chain, and indeed it's in the, in the context of racialized life um, in, 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 the, in the United States, given its history. But principle number two is equality and non-discrimination. Um, and then there are other principles. So I think within the inter-American system, we're also very attentive to the question of people deprived of liberty. And this commission has also actually done a report. Um, and, and Julissa will speak about it. Commissioner Mancia will speak about it. Incarceration, yes, uh, uh, women's incarceration. So and you, police violence. And police violence. So we've done a number of reports. Um, uh, focus on the situation in the U.S., but also generally in the region. Uh, I, I, the, the data you have given and that's available to us is quite astounding and disproportionate, and you, you've all described so well how that reality is connected to the histories of this, of this country and indeed of this region. Uh, Professor McCauley and myself, we come from the Caribbean, where, of course, you know, we also experience the enslavement. Um, and so there's something also that we are sharing historically. And in the situation here, there's an intersectional dimension to incarceration. I, I want to accept everything you've said and the, 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 um, the data, which is astounding. But I want to ask you one question. I have, a number, I have lots of questions, actually. But one question that, that, that's also coming to me, well, a few, let me give, give a few questions. One, have you been able to do any disaggregation on mass incarceration by geography in the United States? Mm -hmm. Like, where are the places where you see, is there a pattern? Um, that's one question. And then, the, is there also a pattern around the incarceration and the treatment of women um, 
Afro, uh, um, uh, African American women in prisons that are managed by private, private, private institutions. In other words, do you have any data on state versus non-state management of, of institutions and, and how uh, women are, are treated in those prisons? And I would like to get uh, any reference that you may have on any studies on that. Um, and then the question of the, the, the charging, uh, and I noticed someone said, and I'm sorry I didn't get your name, you were speaking so fast, you were so, uh, I guess, anxious that you don't run out the clock. Um, so you do have some time, so you can go back on it. But any, any data that you may have on, on, on arrest and prosecutions, racialized arrest and prosecution practices that, of course, give you the pipeline to incarceration. I want to say I very much heard you. Um, again, the names were so fast, but I do really want to, 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 um, to especially mention Ms. Harris and, and your son who is um, incarcerated, and he did write that poem, um, which is really tells the tale, um, the, the outrageous and tragic tale. Tragic for him, but horrific. Tragic and horrific. And I want to thank you for, both of you, for your testimony. Um, uh, to testimony today, and, and I look forward to hearing anything that you wish to tell us, and maybe have some other questions. But the other commissioners also have to speak. Sorry that I went on and on. No, no. <laughs> yeah. I beg your pardon. This is uh, this is a very sort of emotional topic for me. I know, I know. I so, um, <laughs> my my sister, Commissioner Hulisa. Thank you very much, Madam President. Good morning to all of you. Uh, it's an honor to be here. As the president say, I am the past president. <laughs> yes. President Macaulay, current president, and Commissioner Clark, future president for January. So. <laughs> And uh, it's so important for us um, to be here and to listen to you, just to, to mention that uh, from the commission, we have like many reports on that, but one of them is from 2021, is the social economic right for Afro-descendant people. And they have a special mention of the situation of girls and women, how this lack of equality you know, is one of the causes of the discrimination and the situation of women after that in jail. And as Commissioner Clark mentioned, we released this year the report of women uh, deprived of liberty, where we have, because I remember clearly that the President Mac uh, Macaulay state we have to have a special section of Afro-defendant women, Afro-descendant women, and it was this whole situation of discrimination. So thank you very much, as I always say, not only for being here, but for your daily work that is so important for us. I have some questions and comments on that. Um, one of these is, uh, deals with the situation of women, uh, Afro-descendant women in jail concerning sexual and reproductive rights. You know, we have the opportunity to visit several uh, women's uh, center when, for instance, uh, sexual and reproductive rights and the situation of gynecologists, uh, osteoporosis, and this kind of specific situation of women were not taken in account. So if you have more information on that. The other thing is the situation of women and little children. You know, what happened with the children, how they're treated when they are in jail and after when they are re released. The other situation is if there is, I assume there's not, but maybe I'm wrong, policy of reintegration, uh, specific for women, you know, after they are released. Uh, another important point that like, if you have more information, actually you cannot finish this, you can send it after that, is the, how the pandemic of COVID-19 affected Afro-descendant women, especially in jail. Um, and the other thing is uh, the situation of rape and sexual violence inside jail, and not only when they are in prison, but with, they are judged, with all the process, you know, they, when they're detained until they are finally in prison. <laughs> um, we also have, last year I think, or maybe at the, at the start of the year, one hearing on the situation of family, of relatives of people in jail. 
and we know that women has the main burden. So what's going on with these mothers or children, you know, when their mothers are in jail? Because in the case of men, usually mothers are visiting them and wife. But in the case of women, it's not always the same. And finally, just to, if you allow me something, because some of you was mentioning about, because this is a hearing about the situation mainly in the States, but this situation of Afro descendants uh, is, and women is a whole situation in discrimination. Actually, we have people from Caribbean, Colombia, Nigeria, and in Peru. And Peruvian, we have a, like a, a, a special, you know, community for Afro descendants. And I just was to remind, but maybe later you can look for her. There was this poet, uh, artist, woman. Uh, her name is Victoria Santa Cruz. Victoria Santa Cruz. She's a part of the Santa Cruz family in Peru, Afro descendant family. And she has a poem. The name is "They Jail at Me Black." when they uh, tell their story as a little girl when she was five and they start calling her black and offended her and this is a poem just just a little thing that i like to say uh, i don't i don't want to smooth my hair and i love as those to prevent they say to prevent conflict they call me colored people and what a color is black, and how good it sounds, and what rhythm it has. Finally, I realize I don't step back anymore. I walk safe, I walk and hope, and I bless the heaven because God wanted that my, my skin was this black color. And I understood, finally, that I have the total control. So I want to share that because this is a very uh, famous woman, Victoria Santa Cruz, and I, I think that it's very, she will be very proud, I mean, to, to see all the incredible work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much, my sisters. Um, do you want to ask me a question now? Oh, no, you, you, can, you can do that, so don't take the chance and yeah. I use up your time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Just had maybe three questions. Uh, one, the data that you have provided, um, it's, not, it's not new. I think this information has been known for quite a while. Of course, the amplification of it is more and more. But do you... Do you have any examples where you, that you can give us of the state, of any state or at the federal level of any reform whatsoever in the face of this damning data? Are there any signs of change? That's one question. And we spoke about the, the rapes and assaults in prison. Do you also have any data on um, what percentage of reports are investigated and prosecuted and or punished? Is there any data on what's happening to reports of assaults, including sexual assaults in prison? And thirdly, the, of course, the impacts are, are huge in the, the financial impacts, the economic impacts that were spoken about and then the impacts on healthcare. But there are also huge impacts on, on community, community cohesion, on family life. And I just wanted to um, you get any reference that you may want to give us on information on the community and family impacts of mass incarceration. We can we can hazard what they would be, but are there, is there any are there any studies? I just do put in my two cents worth, which I hope will be worth much more than that. And um, I wanted to mention um, what you, you said, um, Maya Maya, um, if I may call you that, um, uh, about the loss of personhood, which has to be the facilities, the, 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 the mechanism has to be put in place for all, all African descendant persons to get their personhood back. You need to know your roots. And there are facilities now to do so. But it costs money. So those who enslaved must pay the price. We have to demand that. Uh, um, because otherwise, as you point out, you would not have true real reparation if they just hand money out. 
and which they will not do anyway. We know that. But they might, if, if we can make the lobbying strong enough, set up mechanisms so that at least, because it is so valuable to have your personhood back. And then um, I wanted to ask if you could give us more information about, if you can give us more information about um, persons who have served their sentences and are released, but with a heavy financial debt to the state. And because that's what, that was one of the first requests. I used to be a rapporteur for women's rights. And that was one of the first requests we made when I was Rapporteur for Women's Rights to the United States, through the State Department, for information on which states practice this and how they calculated this debt and if the person really cannot pay, do they in fact cancel the debt? We never got an answer. And, um, still waiting and repeated um, requests didn't help. Um, because I have I've always thought that that is so horrendously demeaning. You have paid your debt to society. That is what all civilized countries say. You pay your debt to society by serving your sentence. And then you walk out the door when you're finished and they say you owe 70,000 uh, or 100 and something thousand or more. I mean, that is really abusive. And a continuation of the discrimination which we all speak about, a racial discrimination. Because I haven't heard about, also it would be nice to compare with, with um, persons of the white race. Um, whether that, that's it, those sentences are imposed on them. And which states do it? Because I, I haven't been able to clarify that. We need so that we, we can focus on them when we make our interventions and press releases and, and <coughs> statements and reports and write reports. And also, the, um, some states in the US have judges that are not legally trained who are elected because they run the feed store or they are the biggest farmers in the area or all this sort of thing. We have to have data on that as well in order to focus on, on it. Because one cannot, and it is clear from when we hear some of their judgments that they have, there is no <coughs> structure on which they base their sentences except it is clear when they act on racial discriminatory practices of their, themselves that they have. Um, so we would love to have that. And could you please, I know that there are one or two states which have taken steps to deal with discrimination within their criminal justice systems. Not many. But I think there are some um, over the years uh, which have been uh, covered, uh, published by, by news. Well, we would like some definitive information on that, if you could help us with that. So thank you so much. And I'll pass on the floor to our executive secretary. Hello. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, good morning, everyone. And again, I'm very sorry for the retention downstairs, but I'm very happy that you're here and you're having this conversation. In the first place, I want to thank you for the personal stories, which show us that the punitive policies of the state have a face of life, family, a context. They come with a story and with feelings and with love. And thank you for, for that very much. Thank you also for a hearing that combines empirical evidence and research and, and, and from the academic. Thank you so much for combining those two fields and making research in action, and research that is very useful also for us as a multilateral organization. 
a, puni a, a, a punitive policy that has often been expo exported, the one of the United States, to other countries, and that's what we see. And with very bad results, and it's like a loop that repeats once, one again and again and again, and it has been repeated here since 1940 up to date. Increasing penalties, creating new crimes, is not the solution to understand the reasons behind inequalities and access to rights. At, at the Inter-American Commission, we have tools to do the monitoring, and regarding the United States, we can ask more information about these topics in order to engage the United States, and I will be very sure that with our emb embassy here at the permanent mission of the OAS, they will be interested. So my commitment is to share that information with them. But I will also would like to have some more information about certain topics that you just talk. For instance, Ms. Ms. Afia, you talk about reparation. And this is a particular interesting matter because you were not talking about reparation and economic damage or health damage. It's about identity reparation. And I would like to learn a little bit more about that. So if you could bring to us more information, that would be very useful. On March 8, 2023, we launched the report on, on women deprived of liberty in the Americas. And then we show there that the politics on drugs has, has had an influence in the region in order to incarcerate more women in, a, in such a disproportionate way. But I would like to know if in the United States we have the same case a relationship between politics and drugs and incarceration, or what are those kinds of triggers that keeps um, the criminal code, the criminal law, to increase penalties or to increase uh, um, crimes? Now, what are the triggers that harsh the, the, the crimes, that the harsh the policy? And um, so we would like to have some written information to keep, and, and, and we would love to have also a closer relationship with you. Because I think when I re re I'm rereading our report, I think we have to review also, uh, make a critical statement and say, we need to talk about black women in different ways. Not only the ones that are incarcerated, but also the ones that are bringing the burden of raising child, of, of loving someone that is far away, of visiting someone that is far away for years and years and years. And I think we need to visibilize, because at the end of the day, your personal stories are political stories. So thank you so much for being here. And, and uh, we will share the information with, uh, with, with our mission, and we'll hear the mission of the OAS at the of the United States at the OAS. But I would like to hear about reparation, but also what would be a good expectation from you after this hearing? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Madam Executive Secretary Tanya. Um, before, before I hand the floor to you, I just recall something that I, I, I wanted to focus on. And now that I mention it, it has gone out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't recall it. I will mention it when I'm closing, when I remember it, because I didn't make a note of it. Um, but I, something Tanya said reminded me, and uh, it's gone. But, uh, you have 27, is it 27 minutes? Yes. Uh, 15, Madam Oh, 15. Oh, okay, let's say 15 then, 15 minutes. Um, to to make your closing um, comments um, to us. Thank you. I want to, uh, Mama uh, Afia, you're going to speak to the rep reparations, um, and then Tasley is going to speak to the questions about the reform, about the, the statistics, about the population. Dr. Avon is going to talk about and the family situation, and then um, Attorney Guards is going to talk about some of the reforms in the states, and then each of you will talk about what your expectations are after the hearing. We got 15 minutes. Thank you. 
Oh, thank you. <laughs> Um, so th thank you for the references and calling to our t attention the um, OAS um, parallel documents uh, to the United Nations, which is where our uh, experience, greatest experience lies. Um, um, to talk about reparations, I, I think that the president um, makes the uh, rounds it out in a simple word, personhood, that um, full and complete reparations requires restoration of personhood. Um, we uh, have for, um, since the Civil War in the United States, made demands for reparations. Um, and that uh, struggle has um, the visibility and the intensity of that struggle has risen and fallen, um, dependent upon political circumstances. Um, at the moment, it enjoys great visibility and global recognition. Um, and we credit that to the 2001 Durban Declaration and Program uh, of Action, which was um, the opportunity to, be, to globalize um, the issue and to bring together the African community globally uh, in formulating the consensus that the DDPA is. And even more importantly and recently is the struggle to protect and defend the DDPA um, against the onslaught of the, the former or, well, the colonizers, because some of them are still in place, and enslavers um, attempting to distract us from the consensus that was reached with the DDPA. And it's most importantly, it's symbolization and expression of self-determination, setting forth the crimes against humanity and the basis for global reparations, slavery, colonization, apartheid and genocide mm -hmm. and that we must not allow the creation of the and the mandate that was given to the permanent forum on people of african descent <coughs> or the um, agenda 2030 um, uh, sdgs sustainable development goals to become the shiny objects that take us away from the DDPA and the significance of that expression of self-determination, uh, which of course also includes the uh, five elements um, that define, um, give us guidelines as to what would constitute full and complete reparations. We look forward to um, submitting further information on that point and uh, consistent with your, um, the, the questions that, that you have answered. Suffice it to say that the greatest violations continue to occur in the South, or what we call the Black Belt. Uh, the Black Belt, uh, which is where the uh, Afro-descendant population um, was enslaved in largest numbers and continue to this day to live uh, despite our apparent uh, mobility and our escape from, from violence. Finally, I would add that the U.S. Constitution provides for the per continued enslavement of people generally and African people particularly. It was a concession that was made to the South um, wherein the 13th Amendment um, is thought to abolish slavery, however, it does not. It only shifts um, the enslavement of persons from private hands to public hands, to the hands of the government. It provides that um, a person cannot be held in involuntary to except in the case of a crime. And of course, it is the enslavers who have defined what human behavior is criminal and that invariably falls heaviest on people of African descent and African women in particular. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
Um, I want to speak to two things. Um, the question of abuse in state-run versus private um, prison facilities, um, and to the question of racialized arrest practices, um, and um, briefly of debt to the state. Um, the United States Congress mandated under the Prison Rape Elimination Act a comprehensive study of sexual assault and sexual abuse in United States correctional facilities. Um, that study was carried out um, with the Bureau of Justice Statistics. It, it included a representative sample, I think, of maybe 400 um, United States correctional facilities. Um, that study used state-of-the-art methods, and it did document very substantial prevalence of sexual assault um, around the country. Um, and I will highlight not only in adult prison facilities, but in detention facilities that house children. Very widespread prevalence of sexual assault and abuse. And further, um, I'll note that to my knowledge, there is no established difference in rates of abuse in private run versus state run facilities. And th that isn't intended um, to be offered in defense of private facilities so much as I think it speaks to the extent to which our public institutions have been harnessed to abusive ends in a time of mass incarceration. With regard to the question about racialized arrest practices, um, in the contemporary United States, 49% of black men can expect to be arrested by the time they reach age 23. We've seen that, that that's um, the work of Brain and colleagues. The work of Vesla Weaver and colleagues demonstrates that in fact, over the decades of mass incarceration, we have seen what she calls a great uncoupling of arrest from criminalized behavior such that arrest is now so racially targeted that it, it is less and less correlated with engagement in any criminalized activity and more and more strongly correlated with perceived race. And that racial disproportionality, of course, as you all know well, continues at every level of the system and, and its impacts are so devastating, even at the point of um, arrest and policing, as, as your remarks highlighted. Many jurisdictions around the US have implemented what they euphemistically call proactive policing strategies. Stop and frisk, um, hot spot policing, various forms of aggressive police engagement and the implementation of these policies we know from several rigorous social scientific studies is strongly correlated with a drop in well-being across the population, across the black population of those cities. So for example, we see black students' educational achievement drop in New York City with the implementation of stop and frisk. And there are examples like that from social science research across the country. Um, I also wanted to speak to this question, um, I, I think, uh, which is very well taken, of individuals released from incarceration with tremendous debt to the state. Um, to my knowledge, that practice is much more the rule than it is the exception. Um, and those debts have to do with um, everything from system fees, um, parole monitoring fees, uh, court fees, victim restitution, and um, an enormous contributor to that debt is child support enforcement. So many, um, many families have enormous debt to the child support enforcement system after the incarceration of a loved one and to the uh, often um, five-figure debt, um, in particular because um, in most states that continues to rack up. Those arrears continue to rack up during incarceration, even though earning enough funds to pay those commitments is a true impossibility um, during that time. And to the also quite well taken question of what happens 
when individuals are released with debts that are far beyond their capacity to pay what happens to those debts. There is fairly strong um, indication that those debts are paid by the women, family members of incarcerated and released individuals. They are not forgiven. They are shunted onto those who can least afford them. Thank you. I'd like to uh, address the question about what happens when a mother is incarcerated. Um, the first thing I want to say is that when you incarcerate the mother, it has the greatest impact um, on the children. Um, let me give you an example. In Washington, D.C., we don't have a prison. So therefore, when mothers are separated from their children, they are sent across the United States to serve their sentences. That could be California, Texas, uh, uh, West Virginia, for an example. We know that in Washington, D.C., the zip codes that have the highest incarceration rates also have a 16% uh, percent of the people living at or below the poverty level. So how do you stay connected? So let's talk, uh, talk about what happens in the family system. Well, first of all, it's recognized as a crisis. Children are often not told where their parents are because of the stigma and shame associated with it, or perhaps the adults who are raising the children at home don't want to emotionally burden the children. We know that about 11% of fathers are taking care of children. We know that 11% um, of children are going to go into foster care. And the vast majority are going to stay with the grandmother uh, or grandparents who may be on a fixed income. So when we th start to think about, well, what happens with the children, and why is this thing of intergenerational incarceration showing up? Well, the short story is parental incarceration is an adverse childhood experience. Probably 60% of us in this room have gone through an adverse childhood experience. It could be a frequent change of caregivers. It could be um, abuse, neglect. Um, it could be, you know, uh, violence or conflict in the home or parental incarceration. The thing is, is that when children are exposed to contiguous stressors, it actually changes their genetics. Right? So there's this, this, this science called epigenetics. And so when children are living in these situations, incarceration is probably just one issue. You know, there are many complex issues going on at the same time. When the body is exposed to contiguous stressors over and over again, it stays in a state of hypervigilance, and then the cortisol levels are being produced, and those kids are always in fight or flight, even if it doesn't look like like it. They're in fight or flight, and so therefore um, the genes in the body will adjust, and it will start to put all of its energy in the fight or flight rather than fighting off infections. So that's it. I'll, I'll end my testimony. Th thank you. May I <laughs> I just wanted to speak briefly on some reforms that are occurring. Um, in the state of California, the Racial Justice Act was passed, which specifically tries to address um, the effects of racially disparate sentencing and arrest, um, and, and allows for um, somebody who has been convicted to bring forward evidence of racially discriminatory behavior and then allow for some type of reduction in sentencing. Um, and this is, the law is extraordinary in the fact that it is retroactive and it uh, covers all felonies and anybody who's uh, picked up a juvenile case. So as far as like we're concerned, that's basically everybody um, in the state of California who has been arrested has experienced any, any type of confinement. Um, we don't know yet, the law has been passed, we don't know yet how the judges are going to handle that responsibility because it, the Racial Justice Act 2020 Oh, 2021. It was right after George Floyd. Um, people were very inspired to suddenly realize discrimination existed. Um, and so um, we don't know yet 
the, it leaves a lot up to the judges in terms of how they're going to handle each of those cases, but it does allow for statistical evidence of racially discriminatory behavior to be used as evidence to prove, um, to prove the case. And so um, that is one example of reform. There are two other states that have passed racial justice acts. Neither one of those are effective in any way. One is so broad that um, no one can use it, and the other one is so narrow that no one can use it. Or the first one was so broad that it was repealed. <laughs> and the second one is so narrow that it's useless. We don't know yet how California is going to handle this, uh, California judges are going to handle this power. Um, I may say optimistic, but what we've seen in, this, in the United States is that there is a fear of too much justice. That because everyone has experienced racial discrimination, black and brown, and Native American people have experienced racial discrimination that has impacted the way in which they've been engaged with the carceral state, that reform would require everyone to be helped, and the United States is simply unwilling to do that. Nail it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, it now falls to me to close. What do we expect from us Question. Yeah, they will, they will have to write. Yes, yes, definitely. Yes, um, yes, I now have to close, and I remembered what I wanted to ask. Um, is um, the issue of compensation after it has been proven, and quite a few people have been released because of DNA evidence, which proves that the arrest was false, their imprisonment was false. The trials were flawed um, by them being found guilty, and the sentence was uh, false as well. All these were uh, unlawful, uh, as you were. And, and in other countries, of common law countries, definitely I speak to, the, such persons will be compensated by the state for their mistake. In, in, in putting them through such a horrendous thing. And sometimes for 20, 40, 30 years. I notice in the news that lots of people who have been released recently in that way have received no compensation. And this has to be sorted out. After all, American politicians are forever talking about America's largesse financially to not only America, but to the world. So where is it when they are at fault? And I also heard something about social welfare. When they make a mistake and overpay somebody by their mistake, four, five years, 20 years later, they call for the money to be paid back to them. A, a boy who was ill and was being assisted health-wise um, had went up to he was 11 years old. They went back to when he was 11 and said the social assistant should have stopped then. So he he the, who was 11 years old has to pay back the money his parents had debt, So he has to pay the debt. There, there is, <laughs> and I know that the largest number of people in that group would be African women descendants here in America. So we, we have to, would love to focus on that too, if you can find the information to give to us. And what was the question you wanted yes, to done? Expectations, expectations, expectations after the hearing. Yeah. What? Expectations, expectations after the hearing. Oh, after yes. The oh, yes. You, you, you please, if you can put in your written um, submission to us, what you, would, what you want the commission to do for you to assist you in your work, because we are, ought to be collaborating in this work, very important work. And, and, um, and I remind you again to please to submit those presentations you made and additional ones. And, and please, since we're going to co collaborate from today, remember that the commission is here to receive complaints from people you work with to help in this regard. That you can, you can um, make uh, complaints to us about discrimination in all its forms, not only racial, but otherwise as well. And, and, and give us the facts, the person's identity, and so on, 
If they do not wish the identity published in the report, you must let us know when you send the information in. And you can go to the website and see how you can make these complaints. It's there. And we have training in English for the NGOs um, to use our systems. We, we try to make it easier by putting all of the stuff and the website and in English. We, we had to fight for that for years. <laughs> you know, so please use it. Now that, now that it's there. And if not, you can call Laura. <laughs> and she will give you her contact before you leave. Uh, and, and, and do bring complaints to us, because that focuses particular, the use of particular mechanisms within the, the, the commission. And, and we would wish to work as avidly as we can in this regard. It is long past due long, long past you. And I don't understand why the American establishment doesn't recognize that it doesn't all go well for the reputation of the state for this sort of thing to go on. And then I hear politicians on TV, in Congress and Senate, senators and congressmen, talking about how America is not a racist country. That is the biggest <coughs> what I call real politics. Because this is everybody looking around can recognize it, and yet they deny it. So how much trust can one have in the system? So please, let's collaborate. And thank you, thank, thank you, you, thank you. Thank you very much. For coming to us with this. Thank you. 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 This, this <laughs> hearing is now at an end.